So what will I talk about? So let's dive right into it and just give a brief motivation. Um, meta materials or architected materials are all around uh, the world and everybody's working on those. And of course they have a bunch of advantages and this is why we, we love them and why we like them in all kinds of applications because classical materials derive their properties from composition and structure. And it's usually a mess to figure out what the effective properties are. So if you want to model efficiently and accurately the behavior of a piece of metal or ceramic or whatnot, you have to deep uh, dive into microstructure and do complicated modeling. Also, manipulating materials is a challenge. How do you manipulate individual atoms? How do you change the microstructure? This is quite complex. This is why metamaterials or architect materials, as I call them here, uh, are really beneficial because they derive their properties from structural architecture. And so here, effective models means nothing else but the truss models, which we teach in undergraduate mechanics. And manipulating materials means you need a good 3D printer and then you can print those structures and you don't have to move around atoms that much. And that's one of the benefits why uh, this topic of architect and the metamaterials has really caught on across disciplines. Of course, nature is much smarter than us. And for example, if you look at our human body, this is a picture of bone or at least the bone skeleton. What you can see is something like an architect material, a cellular solid that gives our bone the properties that it has to have for you know, functionality that we need in our daily life. With this uh, comes uh, another challenge, namely let's say you want to make a material that's supposed to mimic bone. Then the first thing you realize is that of course no bone is like another and bone is not homogeneous. So if you look at two different points inside a bone, the microstructure will differ based on whatever external loads you apply based on boundary conditions and so forth. And that means that you need to have some kind of spatial variations of the properties and with this of the architecture throughout your material. And doing this carefully is a challenge to address. And finally, in many applications, we do want to add on top of this the challenge of the inverse design. Let's say you want to make a bone implant or a piece of whatnot for your mechanical engineering application. And let's say you want certain properties here and certain properties there. For example, some elastic surface that I'll talk about later. How do you do this? This is the inverse challenge. You want certain properties. How do you make a material that gives you those properties? And so these are the main challenges that I want to talk about for a very particular type of cellular solid that I'll, I'll, I'll show you today. First of all, how do we get accurate and efficient models for the effective properties? Something that's easily fabricable. And I'll show you that there are some issues uh, related also with scalable manufacturing. How do you make large quantities of this? How do you make such materials that have intriguing and nice spatial variations from one end to another? And how do you do the inverse design? How do you come up with optimal microstructures? And so what I'll talk about are mainly four uh, related parts. First of all, I'm going to introduce you to what spinodoids are. You've all seen the title. Um, and some have already asked, what the heck is this? I'll, I'll explain to you what these architectures are. Then I'll talk about the inverse design, which uh, means we'll go a tiny bit into machine learning, uh, but I'll try to stay the surface as much as possible. Then I'll show you a couple of applications, including bone implants and also topology optimization. And towards the very end, I'm going to show you some experiments that Lucas, uh, that, that Carlos Portela did uh, during his time at Caltech. So let's start with these architectures and see what they are. <clears throat> If you look across the design space of architected materials, what you find a lot are truss or plate-based architectures, and more recent years also the shell-based architectures that are based, for example, on triple periodic uh, minimal surfaces. And what many of those have in common is, of course, you can 3D print them neatly. This is an example from my friend and collaborator, Julia Greer at Caltech, who makes these truss structures at remarkably small scales. Here, the scale bar is 40 microns. So this thing is a lot smaller than the thickness of your hair. You can make these structures out of trusses, out of plates, as of periodic shells. The nice thing is the periodicity makes it really easy to extract effective properties. If you know a little bit about homogenization, you just look at one periodic unit cell, and then from this you extract some effective properties. So these structures also have big disadvantages. The first one is this. The dark side of trusses and plates is that all of those have significant stress concentrations whenever you have structural members that meet. In a truss, it would be all the, the nodes, the junctions. If you have plates, you also have sharp interfaces. And what that means is, as engineers, we know, of course, this means stress concentrations. So if you load this thing, you're going to see very high stresses in those corners uh, over here and the same in these cases. And what that means is if you repeatedly load these samples, they're just going to shatter and disappear. You might get lucky with size effects and all kinds of things, which is what Julia was exploring a while ago. But ultimately, most of these trusses develop so severe stress concentrations that they just fail if you continuously load those, especially at large strains. It further means that if you start with a periodic design, these are very sensitive to imperfections. 
which means if you have any symmetry breaking defects, let's say a stress is missing or is bent or is broken or whatnot, these misalignments can easily lead to complete failure because the imperfections break the periodicity of the system. And that's also not very favorable. And the last point is, if you actually want to come up with spatially graded structures, there's a problem with a limited design space. Because let's say you use some periodic trusses where on one hand of your body, you want to have a cubic shaped unit cell. On the other end, you want to have a tetragonal or hexagonal or whatever unit cell. How do you smoothly go from one to another? What do you do in between? If you smoothly want to grade the system, you have to come up with a way to smoothly change from one architecture to another. And with these periodic unit cell based approaches, that's very tricky. Now, if we look into nature, uh, it's hardly ever periodic and it's hardly ever a sharp corner type. What you see in nature are smooth and non-periodic architectures, be it bone, uh, nanoporous foams, uh, bamboo, or uh, fibrous na uh, networks. In these cases, you always have smooth architectures and you have non-periodic architectures. And that's the key to what we want to do here. And this is what led us to these spinodal or spinodoid structures. So, Maybe first to explain what is spinodal decomposition. This is where all of this is motivated. If you take a mixture of two phases and you let it demix at the so-called spinodal point, for example, by cooling things down, what may happen is that this separates into two phases. Think about taking oil and water and you know putting them in a blender, blending it, and then let it sit. If you just wait over time, what's going to happen is these two are going to demix and you're going to see two phases popping up, either as bubbles or as structures. You can do this with many systems. What was fashionable some 20, 30 years ago is making nanoporous foams in such a fashion. Namely, you would mix silver and gold, for example. You would mix them at certain high temperature. And then as you go through the spinodal decomposition, exactly the same thing happens. Gold and silver demix. Each wants to be a homogeneous phase. And what you end up with is these bicontinuous structures where this would be gold and everything that's missing here would be filled with silver. If you then uh, get rid of one of the faces, you ended up with these nanoporous foams. This is a very natural process of phase separation. Um, it's also the one that governs a lot of self-assembly that you see in nature. And that's the reason why these smooth spinodal-like structures is what you see very often naturally occurring in uh, typical examples, not only in these foams, but they also look pretty much like what you would expect in bone and so forth. And the reason is because in nature, many of the structures that we see come from separation, self-assembly and growth processes that are governed by these types of mechanisms. So if you put some mathematics behind this, um, you can model this, this diffusion-based uh, phase separation in a very simple way. Let's just, just put up a simple phase field model where phi is my phase field variable that depends on position x and time t. And let's say that if phi is one, I'm in the red phase, and if phi is zero, I'm in the blue phase. And if phi is between zero and one, that means we are in an interface in between. It's a diffuse interface phase field approach. Now, this demixing is usually governed by some kind of energy. Let's say there is uh, some, some thermodynamic energy that we can use here to drive the process. This usually consists of one energy, which is, is coined Ginsburg Landau in general, which is a bi or multi stable system, as I was sketching here. This is the energy which wants to drive your variable phi either to zero or to one, because these are the minimum energy states. And then the second term is important because this is the interface energy. So gradients of phi mean you are in an interface, and the second term is the one that regularizes the whole process. This is the one that gives rise to smooth interfaces. That's the reason we don't see sharp corners. If I take this out, you can see crazy sharp um, structures. But with this, you get very smooth interfaces. The smoother and the broader, the larger your interface energy. And if you have such an energy and the process goes on, uh, you have to solve an equation. Let's assume that the mean concentration remains uh, fixed. So there are no chemical processes. Your silver and gold concentration that you put in, in the beginning remains exactly the same. Then such a process is usually governed by the so-called Panhilliard equation. And what that means is that the time evolution of your phase field phi is governed by the divergence of the flux. And the flux is nothing else but a mobility tensor times the gradient of your driving force. And the driving force is the variation of the derivative of W with respect to the phase field. Let me show you quickly what happens. So let's say we start from the blend. So it looks at the beginning like this and you let go. And if you simply, we're doing nothing here but to simulate this equation, you see the demixing, you see these, these, these structures evolve. And this is what comes out. Just one comment because I'm gonna get back to this later. There are two sources of anisotropy that can generally happen. They can give rise to structures that do not look nice and isotropic, but have some directional preference. 
On the one hand, the interface energy could be direction dependent. This is what happens in atomic systems, especially uh, mat metallic ceramic systems. And the mobility could also be anisotropic if your faces can move faster in some directions than others. In those cases, you would see structures that are not isotropic, but anisotropic. So what I showed you is, okay, we have this process and over time these structures come out. The longer you wait, the coarser the structures come. And if in the end you want to turn this into a cellular solid, you have to get rid of one of the faces. For the face field approach, all this means is, for example, let's retain all those points where my face field phi is larger than the threshold phi zero. What that means is here, for example, I'm just taking all the white regions and I'm getting rid of the black, and here's my cellular solid. Now, simulating this is very cumbersome because you have to solve complicated time evolution equations with some explicit implicit solvers and so forth. Luckily, there's a shortcut to this. And this was actually known by Kahn himself in the old days and then picked up again in recent years by, by Jens Weissmuller, Svante Bachmann and others, where the idea is you wanna go straight from here to there through a nice theoretical approach. And it turns out there actually is a analytical solution for what these structures look like and it's given in terms of Gaussian random fields, which I want to explain to you in the next few slides. So the whole take up, uh, the, the, the main point here to remember is that instead of doing these complicated simulations, I do want to know the, simu the uh, solution for what this phi of x looks like right away. And if I know that, I can generate these structures however I want without having to go through this process. And I'll show you that we can actually use that in order to tune the design and the architecture uh, in a moment. So what are these funny Gaussian random fields? Let me show you. And I apologize to those who know inside out what they are. I, I just tried to explain to everyone what I'm talking about here. So let's assume that my phase field phi of x is nothing else but the cosine of beta n dot x minus gamma, where beta and gamma are some constants and n is nothing else but a unit vector pointing in some direction. If I plot this, this is nothing else but you know this up and downy kind of structures that points, uh, that looks like this. If I look at this from the top, you can see the, the ridges and the valleys, it looks like that. The um, ridges and valleys are aligned perpendicular to my n direction. This is how I defined the whole thing. Gamma in this case is nothing else but a shift to the left or to the right if you want, but it's not of great importance here. And the beta is the one that controls the length scale. So the larger you make beta, the smaller your features are gonna get. And inversely, if you make beta really small, you're gonna have very wide features over here. So beta is nothing else but a length scale. Now, what you can do is you can take this and you can put a level set or a threshold on top. Let's say, for example, I just retain everything that has a phi larger than a certain value. And what happens then is you get these black and white images where black you know, means below and white means above a threshold. You just put a sigmoid on top. And this is what you can use to generate these black and white structures. Now, this phi zero in principle also governs the density of your structures because you could easily imagine that if you move this white line up and down, you're gonna make more stuff white or more stuff black based on which phi zero you choose. If you do this in 2D, again, let's say now I'm adding two of these uh, cosine type harmonic functions, what happens is now the structure looks like this. If you look at it from the top, this is what you would see. We now have two uh, lines perpendicular to which uh, things are going to grow with n1 and n2 being the two directions over here. <clears throat> and again, if you put a threshold on top, you can generate these structures on the right. For phi greater or equal to zero, you put your line in the middle and you can see this, this checkerboard patterns come out. If you lift your phi even higher, you're just going to retain these dots at the top. That's what you see over here. And if you choose everything where phi is almost exactly zero, that means you're just retaining the interfaces of this picture. And that means you get a cellular structure, which looks like this down here, where the white would be material and the black is gone. So these are just two of the cosine terms. What we're doing now is we're adding a lot of those. And so here is an example where I'm adding a total of 40 of these cosine terms. We choose the same beta so that we retain the same length scale for all of those, but we choose 40 different n vectors. And here in 2D, I'm just choosing, choosing them randomly to some uh, normal distribution on the unit circle. So these are all my n vectors for this example. And these gammas are just random numbers between zero and two pi also taken from, uh, uh, again, from Gaussian distribution. If you now plot this phi, what happens is you get a structure over here. And this is pretty much the isotropic uh, structure that comes out. And one can show that this thing, if you were to add over all kinds of vectors in 3D, is actually a solution of the kahn hilliard equation. This is the isotropic Gaussian random field, and you will always end up with isotropic uh, structures that come out. Now, the key idea behind this, the, this final that I'll talk about is the following. 
if we simply do not sample these n vectors from the entire unit circle, but we sample them from certain regions, what happens then is you clearly give a bias to the whole thing. So your material is not uniformly isotropically aligning through space, but what happens is your material wants to align perpendicular to particular directions, just that, like the laminate I was showing you a few seconds ago. And this is the, the whole point about generating anisotropic structures. So what we did specifically is, let's say I define my phase field in such a fashion. I'm adding n of these cosines where n is some large number. The n vectors n i are chosen randomly, but we're not going to choose them randomly from all of uh, the surface of the sphere. But let's say we limit those. And let's say we limit them, for example, to vectors that like close to the x1, x2, and x3 axes. And to be a bit but to be a quantitative, uh, what I'm going to say is that let's choose these n vectors to lie within cones of angles theta 3, theta 1, and theta 2 away from the axis. And so in this case, these three angles would be our design parameters that tell us where these n vectors are supposed to be. An additional unknown that we can tune is the relative density, which means if you remember, I can move my phi zero up or down, and that led it to different densities of the structure that comes out. And this is how I want to to describe these structures, these are not spinodal structures anymore. These are completely computational theoretical structures. You don't see them come out of a natural process, but we can easily write them down mathematically. They are spinodal-like, but they're not spinodal structures. And that's why we call them spinodoid. So how do these structures look like? I'll give you a couple of examples. In this case, we choose these n vectors to lie only in these two cones. What this means is material wants to align perpendicular to these two directions. But because we have many vectors within the cone, it's not going to be just a laminate, but you're going to get a structure that we call laminar, because it looks like lamella being stacked on top of each other. And of course, the mechanical properties reflect that. For example, if you look at the elasticity, what I'm showing you here on the right is nothing else but Young's modulus measured in all kinds of direction. This is very pancakey, meaning it's very soft in the x3 direction. I can easily compress this top down but it's very stiff in the other direction, which makes sense, right? If you think about lamella, uh, it's very soft to compress the thing, but it's very stiff in the other two directions. If you choose your vectors to lie in two of the cones, what it means is material wants to align in the third direction. What comes out is a columnar topology whose elasticity is also of this type, so it's very stiff along this direction, but it's very soft in the other two in plane directions. Uh, you can go to town with this and do all kinds of things. This is an example of a cubic structure where what you see is material aligns in a cubic type fashion and out comes an elasticity surface uh, that is orthotropic, is very stiff along the primary axis, but soft in between. And so you can choose this in any type you want. Out comes a nice topology. And the nice thing is here, there's no need for running, you know, mathematical uh, explicit implicit time stepping to find your structures evolve over time. You have the answer in one shot because you can write down what the Gaussian random field looks like. You can actually code this thing in MATLAB in 10 lines or something like this. It's relatively trivial. If I, I, and I uh, invite everyone to try it out if you want to see these structures. It's relatively easy. So. Now, so far, what I've been telling you is that we theoretically cook up these structures, but that there's no physics to them. Uh, let me try to convince you that these structures actually do have a physical origin, if you have a tiny bit of creativity. So let me go back to the math I was showing you previously. We have some energy that drives the whole process. There's some Ginsburg-Landau energy that is, let's say, uh, double weld to drive your concentration C to be either 0 or 1. I know you see for the concentration here instead of T. This is my interface energy. We can compute the driving force, in this case, the chemical potential, as the uh, variational derivative, which is nothing else but this. <clears throat> the flux is my mobility tensor times the gradient of the chemical potential. And then the kahn hilliard equation says nothing else but dc by dt <clears throat> is the same as the divergence of the flux, which, you know, if you do some math, ends up to be this to leading order. And what I mean by leading order is we're not interested in phase separation, you know, after long times, but we want to know what happens in the early stage when these two phases separate and when after short amounts of time, you're still close to the point of separation. Now, as Khan uh, himself knew, I guess, a long time ago, and as was picked up more recently, as I said, there's an analytical solution to this equation. <clears throat> and the analytical solution looks like this down here. So the concentration is the initial mean concentration plus, and here come the fluctuations that lead to the phase separation. And they look like this. What we're doing is we're summing over all beta vectors in 3D space. These are the cosines that could look familiar to you. There's some amplitudes in front. 
And most importantly, there's this exponential in front. And this is essentially the growth term. What this says here, t is time, is that not all directions are going to grow in the same fashion. This r of beta is just short for the square root of n dotted into mn, n again being a mobility tensor, and then there's some function that comes behind. Now, what I want to do is these beta vectors are from all of d-dimensional space. Let me normalize them by saying every beta vector is nothing else but the length beta or magnitude times a unit vector n. In this case, I can rewrite this as the sum over all possible lengths beta and the sum over all n's which lie on the unit sphere. Right? And then I can just rewrite the whole thing. And now what I'm asking is, let's see which of these terms actually dominate, because this is an infinite sum over cosines, but not all of them are equally important. And what happens in particular is if we look at these growth factors, let me rewrite them up here. For this thing to grow, this guy has to be positive. If it's negative, that means you have e to the minus something over time that's going to disappear. Moreover, if you have exponential growth, what it means is from all these terms, the one that's going to dominate is the one with the largest r. And if you plot this term back here, the minus of double prime beta squared minus 2 kappa beta to the fourth, it actually looks like this because the minus of double prime must be negative for this to work. This looks like classical nucleation theory, where at small betas, you first rise, and then you drop again. This would be the critical beta, above which nothing is going to happen. And there's a maximum beta somewhere over here. And what I'm saying now is if you add up all of these exponentials to the power of r times t, there is a maximum r that you can reach, and the maximum beta uh, that corresponds to that. And from all the many cosine terms that you have, it's going to be these max terms that are going to dominate the whole process. You can actually find this maximum very easily. This is a simple uh, thing to maximize. The beta max looks like this if you plug it in. What you're going to get out is this r, r max is nothing else but some prefactor that depends on these energetics times the directional dependence. And so this shows us that you grow differently in different directions based on m, based on the mobility tensor. If we now go back to this concentration, this is the solution I was showing you on the previous slide with all the cosines, the sum over all betas and the sum over the unit sphere. What I'm saying now is let's forget the sum over all possible betas because it's these maximum values that are going to grow the most and the fastest. So I'm simply going to get rid of this and I say everything is growing only at this maximum beta value. I plug it in here. And furthermore, this r max is then nothing else but some factor, let's call it r0 times t, times this directional dependence down here. And if m is isotropic, that means all directions will grow in the same fashion because this thing, which looks pretty much like the stretch, uh, the linear stretch that we know from, from continuum mechanics, is the same in all directions. But if m is anisotropic, that means certain directions will be biased and preferred over others. So if I now take an m just for fun, let's say it's 1, 1, and 1 plus some number m, where this m I'm going to raise from 0 to, let's say, 10, for example. If I now plug this into my phase field, this is the thing I had on the previous slide, and now let's say I plot this here. I can get rid of the thing in front because it's just a coefficient, so time doesn't really matter. It's just you know changing over time, but with a constant in front. If I now take a Fourier transform of this, that means I'm trying to see where all the cosines are going over time. And if I plug this m vector in here, if this little m is 0, that means I have isotropy. And in this case, what you see is actually the Fourier transform gives you a perfect circle, meaning these cosines are aligned in all 360 directions in 2D and all possible directions in 3D. The moment you increase your little m, you're giving a preference towards the x3 axis. And what that means is that these thingies are going to change, and it's getting narrower and narrower and narrower. What happens in the end is the only terms that remain in the cosine are actually the ones where n is pointing up or n is pointing down. And so what this means is if you have an anisotropic mobility tensor in the diffusion because of chemical reasons, because of directional diffusion processes, you would expect that those n terms dominate that align with the direction of your m anisotropy over here. And this whole thing you can actually repeat. Uh, if you put different numbers on the three diagonals, you will see that, of course, it scales. You will have the same approach in all three directions. If you put them all together, you have these superimposed. And so going back to the math, this was the Gaussian random field that I had before. I do one more thing. I, like I said, I get rid of this time-dependent thing in front. I just divide by it because I don't care about it. I subtract the mean because I don't care about it either. And I normalize this whole thing so that it ranges uh, from minus 1 to 1. And then what happens is we get exactly the form that I was trying to sell to you earlier as finitoid. And 
what it means is that these n vectors in the end, we have to choose some large number of these n vectors, but for example, we choose them from the three cones that I was trying to advertise. Physically speaking, it means nothing else, but we have preferred diffusivity or mobility in those directions, and then it should come out naturally. I'll get back to this at the very end. So this is the design space. You can make them columnar, cubic, laminar. You can also do funny things. This is an older paper we worked on in a slightly different context, but you could also make symmetries you don't see in nature. For example, trigonal, where you have triangular symmetry in the system. Or you can make it such that you, know, you have symmetries where your n vectors are at some odd angles that you would never see, for example, in crystallographic systems or so. Computationally, it's easy to do. All you need to do is pick those n vectors in the right directions and out come these structures that you have in the end. There's one other reason that we get intrigued by these spinodoids, and that is they allow us to do one more thing. Because we don't have to do time evolution, we can write down this Gaussian random field right away. All you have to do is pick these n vectors, and then you, know, you have your representation. You can do one more thing. You can actually do spatially graded structures. This is an example where I'm using an isotropic Gaussian random field. And from left to right, I'm simply changing this beta factor in front. If you remember, that's the one that governed the length scale. So what it means is I'm making the pores smaller and smaller, but I can do this in a continuous fashion. No need to stitch two different materials together. I can easily make a piece of bone where you know the length scale of features goes across orders of magnitude in a continuous fashion. All you do is you change beta from one end to another. You can even more, uh, do it even more fancy. So here's an example where on the left, we want it to be columnar. On the right, we want it to be lamellar. And we want a continuous smooth grading. All we do here is we take the Gaussian random field. T1 is the one on the left. T2 is the one on the right. And we do some kind of linear interpolation in between. Strictly speaking, we don't take a linear one. We take some kind of uh, Gaussian interpolation. But you can take anything you want. What you get is a smooth transition. Because by the end of your day, you have an analytical expression for the Gaussian random field at every single point. All you need to do then is put your threshold on your level set and what you get out of these nice structures that you see here. And to show that it works mechanically, if I now compress this left and right, this is the displacement field just to show for fun. The columnar is very stiff. It's not going to deform at all. The laminar, as we discussed, is very soft in this direction. So if you compress this, the right side, uh, sorry, I confused left and right, I think. Uh, I do this a lot. Uh, the right is, is carrying most of the deformation, the left is not. And so in, there is no disturbance in the middle. That's the nice thing. So it actually works. It works in 2D. So here's a, a union, a fusion of cubic isotropic columnar laminar. All we do is an interpolation of these four. And that works quite nicely. So this got us hooked up with these spinodoids, and we wanted to explore them more. And the one question we haven't really answered is, is what about the inverse design? So what we normally do is the following. We went from cellular architecture to mechanical properties, right? I showed you an architecture. Then we do homogenization with finite elements or something. And then we get the properties. That's what we normally do as engineers. But we want the inverse. Let's say you want a piece of bone that has a very specific anisotropic elastic stiffness. How do you make that structure? That we don't know. And so the idea was the following. We wanted to use some data-driven approach. We have all these structures that I just showed you and thousands of others. We can just generate these n vectors randomly. And we have a set of structures and associated stiffnesses. But the question is, how do we go the other way around? Given an elastic stiffness, what does the structure have to look like? And that was the big question mark. And this is really uh, Sid's merit. He is an expert in machine learning. Um, and what we put together is the following. <clears throat> so. What we want to do is this. Let's say we do know topologies and their stiffness, but now someone comes along and says, OK, I want a stiffness surface that looks like that. Why is my stiffness? And he asks us, what is the topology that gives me exactly that stiffness? Of course, we could go to our lookup table and try to find one that matches the one. But you know, this is what people did uh, 50 years ago with lookup tables and books. Um, what we want to do now is actually come up with a sophisticated approach to do this. So we want to have some kind of, in this case, neural networks, some machine learning that tells us, well, you hand me a stiffness, and I give back to your topology, which has that stiffness. So find x, the design parameters that belong to a stiffness y. But there's a catch. This problem cannot work. And it cannot work for a very simple reason, because it is ill-posed. Think about the following. If you hand me a certain stiffness, it's very likely that I can hand you at least three, five, or 10 topologies that all have exactly the same stiffness. There's no reason that there should be a unique solution 
uh, especially for uh, you know um, uh, some some very uh, common uh, stiffnesses, uh, it may be very very ill posed. Uh, just think about an isotropic case uh, where how they even rotate the sphere, where your x1, x2, x3 axis and so forth is not unique. You can generate many topologies with the same stiffness. So this problem is inherently ill-posed. What we did is the following. Let's say you hand me a stiffness and I generate some topology which hopefully has that stiffness. What I do is I don't compare it to the structures that we have in our training set, but what I do instead is I actually homogenize this topology and I compute its effective stiffness. And then I compare these two stiffnesses. And these I can uniquely compare. I can check if these two surfaces are the same up to rotation, of course. We can remove the rotations. We're mechanical engineers, so we know how to get uh, rotations out of a fourth order tensor. And then we can compare these two, and that is unique. Unfortunately, that's very expensive uh, because every time doing an FE homogenization, these meshes are expensive. It takes a couple of minutes to run that. We don't want to do this. So we introduce a second neural network. And this is now the whole approach uh, that, that we used. The idea is this, you take your topologies and you first try to find a data-driven approach that tells you for a given topology what its stiffness is. This one is unique. There's no non-uniqueness in this. You hand me a structure, I compute its stiffness. That's a one-to-one -one relation, that's, that, that's easy. And this one we can train, that's the so-called forward neural network because we go forward to actually predict the properties of that thing. Once we have this, we can use it to also train this inverse network by comparing these two values of stiffnesses. And that actually works. That works very nicely. So we're never comparing topologies, but we're comparing the stiffness y that you give me to the stiffness that I compute based on the topology x that is hopefully the one that gives you the stiffness. And so this is uh, very neat. What we had to do is generate a large set of these samples, a total of about 23,000. Uh, it took about five days to generate all this. But the training time of these networks was about 20 minutes on a simple computer. The accuracy magically is on the order of 98%. And also to advertise this, going from here to here, the surrogate model is nothing else but a shortcut to homogenization. And this model takes about one millisecond to compute the effective stiffness of a complex topology, as opposed to five minutes of FEM homogenization in a parallel code. So what we do with this is we can actually try to predict structures that have a certain topology, uh, that have a certain stiffness. Sorry. Let me show you how this works. And these are the applications I wanted to mention here. First bone, and then very quickly topology optimization. Bone implants are a big issue. Uh, they're usually made from some kind of metal that's biocompatible, uh, titanium, some are made of steel. One of the big issues is that they typically tend to do what we call stress shielding if there's a stiffness mismatch. Imagine that you put an implant in whose stiffness is significantly higher than that of the surrounding bone. And that's very likely if you put a piece of steel into a human body. If you have such a stiffness mismatch, unfortunately, it leads to bad atrophy and long-term incompatibility. What happens is that the material surrounding the implant is not loaded mechanically as it should be loaded because that thing here is way too stiff. And so over a long time, what happens is you get degradation, you get long-term issues, and essentially the healthy bone surrounding the implant is going to die over time or going to go away, and that's a severe issue. And it's not as simple as using a soft material because this thing varies a lot. So the bone down here is not the same as the bone down here or down there or over there. So it really varies by position. And ideally, you want to adjust the stiffness of this thing to the stiffness of the surrounding bone. And in addition, you need to make changes because that changes from point to point inside the human body. What you see down here is the variability of uh, actual bone uh, in its relative density and its stiffness, uh, number of samples, uh, this is the relative density, so volume over volume of the unit cell. And this is the normalized Young's modulus, uh, the stiffness. There's a huge variability across the samples that people normally look at. And this was taken from a, a clinical study. So our approach is very simple. Let's say you give me an elastic surface, and instead of showing you these colorful plots, I'm not just throwing, showing you three cross sections of that, E1, E3, E2, E3, and E1, E2. And let's say you give me the red surface because this is what you want, right? You give me three of those. In total, it's gonna to make one of these colorful plots. We did one simplification here. We actually made it orthotropic, uh, which is we made sure that this red thingy that you gave us actually has three principal axes and is orthotropic. That's a relatively small change in the figures. 
And then we turned the crank and shuffled this through the data-driven machine learning approach. <coughs> what came out is this topology. So it looked like that. It had a relative density of about 31%, and the cone angles looked a little bit like this. So it's, it's about a columnar structure. Now, of course, what I didn't tell you right away is that this input elastic surface is not just anything, but it is a measured elastic surface from actual human bone. And the bone structure looks like this. This is a micro CT image of, oh, it's actually bovine femoral bone, sorry. And the relative density was 30%. So what this means in this particular case, and we tested not just one, but a whole bunch, the network that we trained and that we used gives us a topology that actually looks a little bit like what the human bone looks like. It has almost the same relative density and it produces pretty much the same elastic stiffness. And what's remarkable about this is the whole model doesn't know anything about bone. At no point in time did we put information about the bone into either the mechanical model, the spinodoids, or the machine learning part. And so we see this as a great tool uh, for, for bone implants, especially because you can spatially uh, vary it. You can have different stiffnesses and densities in different points of the bone. You can do it in this fashion. Let me actually jump over this because we're soon running out of time and I still want to show you the experiments. What you could also do with this is topology optimization. Classical topology optimization, you know, makes these black and white structures to optimize a structure for a given load. What we can actually do is we can assume that in every point of the sample, you have one of these spinodoid architectures. And then the design parameters are essentially the three cone angles, the relative density, and the orientation of this in space. So we can rotate this also in 3D. And then you can do topology optimization based on these structures at a small scale. And what comes out are nicely optimized structures, but it's not black and white anymore. You can actually have gradients. And what they mean is simply the microstructure is going to change from one point to another. For example, here, the relative density is smoothly going to change from very high to very low. But it's not just a mathematical exercise. You can actually print these structures because the GRFs allow us to do the spatial gradient and to allow us to change the uh, design parameters from one point to another. So in the last few minutes, I think I need only five more. So um, I want to show you some experiments because everything so far has been computational and we've had a very fruitful collaboration with Julia Greer and Carlos Portela at Caltech, uh, back from the old days when we still used to be at Caltech as well. Um, and there I want to show you some experiments. These are actual cubes fabricated. Uh, they are shown here under a scanning electron microscope because they're tiny. So if I zoom into those, you can see the scale bar on the bottom corner. These are cubes that have a size about 150 micrometer. If we zoom further in, that's what they look like. And uh, Carlos used a very particular technique here. He first 3D printed these architectures. So this is no self-assembly or spinal decomposition. This is 3D printing the architectures that I just showed you. He then coats them with the ceramic, alumina, and then he etches out the polymer. And what you're left with is these thin structures uh, that are made of alumina, and that's what you see here. They're actually so thin that on the electron microscope, you can even look through the structures. So if you look at this carefully, you can look through layers of this, because these are made of alumina ceramic layers that have a thickness on the order of maybe 15 to 20 nanometers. The nice thing, of course, is there are no kinks or edges anymore, as I was saying in the beginning. These are 100% smooth because of the spinoid architecture. So even computationally, if you look at stress concentrations, you will not find any because it is a smooth structure. So unlike trusses and plates and many of the things that were showing initially, no stress concentrations anymore. If you do 3D printing, you can print anything. So these are the structures that we computationally predicted, for example, uh, laminar, uh, cubic, uh, some odd ones, isotropic, uh, columnar, and so forth. You can actually make those guys. You can probe the stiffness. And you will see that you have very strong differences in the stiffness in the various directions. These are some more examples uh, where you can see uh, beautiful images. This is 50 microns, uh, these, these architectures at the small scale. When it comes to the mechanical properties, there are a few intriguing features I want to make towards the end. The first one is if you actually plot Young's modulus as a function of its, this is, oh, sorry, it's chopped off. This should be the relative density meaning it's the mass that is contained inside a cube of a certain size. So what is the, think of it as what is the density of this thing compared to the density of the base material? And what happens with these, these structures magically, and not magically, but very nicely, is that as you decrease the density, the scaling of stiffness with density is almost linear. And that's pretty close to the upper bound, the fork bound that we know. So if you take out more and more material, you're just linearly decreasing the stiffness. 
which is different from all other structures that we know. Uh, what you see in red here is the scaling of trusses. Uh, what you see in blue is the scaling of the shell type TPMS structures. Usually, if you decrease the stiffness, you're going at a different uh, uh, scaling uh, coefficient, which means you're losing stiffness much faster if you go down in density. You don't do this with these spinodoids. And that has a reason. If you look at the curvature in those and you plot the principal curvatures at every single point, what you see is that most of this falls onto this line down here. What this means is you actually have doubly negative curvature. At every point, you have a positive and a negative curvature, and they're combined. And this is the trick that the X shell is also using uh, to gain its high stiffness. In the interest of time, I think I don't want to go too much into this. Feel free to ask me about it if you have a question. What I'd like to show you instead, and this is much more impressive, is this over here. What Carlos did here is he took a sample and he put it into an indenter. Now we're going to compress this thing. Remember, this is a ceramic shell. He's going to compress this to about, what is it, 25 to 30%. And now here is the movie playing. What you see is it compresses, it buckles, it does all kinds of crazy things. It unloads, and it comes almost back to zero as if nothing had happened. Here's the second cycle, following almost the same. And now remember, this is ceramic. Try to do this at home with your favorite vase. Well, maybe not with your favorite one, but to try to take a ceramic vase and compress it to 30% and expect it to come back. It doesn't happen easily. It happens for two reasons. The one is that these small scales, you have size effects and you have a scarcity of defects. But the second one is these structures are designed to not have any stress concentrations at points inside that lead to failure. Now, the final point, this is ongoing work, is that you can actually make those by self-assembly as well. And this is something that uh, Carlos Portella together with Daryl Yee has been uh, trying to figure out. You can actually take polymer blends or emulsions and try to let them self-assemble chemically, driving the process to generate these structures. This is actually one of the first attempts we just published this last year, where uh, Carlos and Daryl made these samples on the order of centimeters that have features on the order of a few micron. These are the thin shells I was just talking about. These are isotropic, admittedly. There's no anisotropy yet. But these structures actually do have the same features, but these are not 3D printed. They just happen by chemical diffusion, by self-assembly. Uh, and what this means is you can bypass the limitations of 3D printing. You can actually make centimeter-sized objects which feature, with features on the micrometer scale, which we can never do with 3D printing. And so what I've talked about today is what the heck are these spinodoid architectures? How do we do the inverse design of those? Some applications and experiments towards the end. And there are many other intriguing properties that one can think of. Some of those we're working on, others we're not. So if any experts are in the room, um, what's obvious, of course, is to look into strength and toughness. These are things being done more or less. Uh, but you can imagine these structures also be very interesting for fluid mixing, for mass and heat transport and things like that. Um, we're also looking into, I think Sid is mainly interested in a comparison to the morphology of bone, going beyond just stiffness, but trying to find out more what are the similarities to bone. Um, Carlos is very interested in the scalable fabrication route for these anisotropic architectures. Uh, maybe a question for the theoreticians in the room. Now that we have this Gaussian random field representation in closed form, is there a possibility to attract analytical estimates for mechanical properties, for example, bounds and the stiffness and so forth? If you want to find out more, um, these are the, the two papers I recommend. The codes for these structures are also publicly available. So if anyone wants to use them for the research, feel free to do so. Just check out our website or the Gibbon Library. And with this, I'm finally done. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, of course, be very happy to take comments or questions. Merci beaucoup.